there's some people here that don't know anything about my work, so I'm going to have to kind of rewind a little bit and bear with me those of you that do know all this. So I work with direct casting methods using mainly jesmonite, which is a plaster polymer, which is the white material that you see here, and sometimes cement fondue. And I pour either directly onto the surface of the floor, a casting mat on the floor, or into a built or partially built mould or form, of which these are photographs of, and sometimes the material spills out. When the material, the jesmonite dries, the, the paint, cement powder, sand, often in some work, not in this, though, there is cement and paint in this work. It's on the surface of the floor, which some of it's intentionally laid there and sort of shuffled and marked in different ways, and some is there through the process of other work, so there's a kind of history in the layers of that casting surface, is picked up into the underside surface of the work, so all the surface coloration texture marks are all the jesmonite doing its thing, like picking it up wet and embedding it into the underside surface of the work. Nothing is added on afterwards. So there's some element of sort of serendipity. There's some control, but also some beautiful other loss of what's there as well. So these, these are some of the moulds that I use to make some elements of some of the pieces of work. And they were quite complex moulds in these cases, in the case of this body of work, because they were sort of taken from the telephone exchange, bits of roadways, Stevenage flyovers, the sort of um, the kind of pincer shape, some shape that divides a motorway, the barriers, those kinds of things. Because I travel through Stevenage every day when I go to work, so I go under these flights of cars. And I thought that it was interesting to, because I, I've always, as I said in the introduction, been interested in my, you know, the architectural plans and models that my father would bring home or take me to see. So the photographs are made as a record of that starting point really because only ever one form comes out of the mould so those moulds then don't exist at all apart from in photographic form but you might be able to see some of them in some elements of the work that's here. Others will have become so kind of construed with other bits of the forms that it's almost impossible to identify them in the building of the work. Because when, and this is the way I make it work, so when a form emerges then I'll leave it and it suggests itself as to how it might be locked in with another form and what it might start to emerge as, as a kind of animate or inanimate thing in its own right, or a sort of organic, inorganic form, which beautifully refers back to Bennett. And they become things in their own right, which is off, which is always why they are named at the end as the thing that they appear to have some resonance with. What I found interesting was, and I only found this out because John said to me, actually, when we came up yesterday, that this was a pr propeller factory fabric. Can you know? But I didn't know that, of course you do. And I was thinking that was really quite intrigued me because these two pieces have that, you know, kind of like plain, like spinnery type, you know, but they have an organic wing type form as well. The, the way that the forms sort of collide and coalesce is that they 
these are quite a new departure in a sense because they lock together. So these two pieces are made with three separate forms that have been very carefully cast, but with a starting point of something that emerges thing its own right, to stand up and lock together sculpture with weight to become one object. And I kind of like that whole kind of like model kit thing that kind of locks together and feels like a, you know, that's another thing I used to do, I used to make model aeroplanes, you know, it's like that air kit, you know, that's what I did. <laughs> so it's like I'm really interested in that. And again, they all kind of like, they're all separate bits, but they all lock in and just with their own weight. Pinzer, for example, does a similar thing. This one, Again, it's not one form, it comes apart. So it kind of sits and balances and just hooks. This, this piece of work um, has, is the most recent piece of work in here, actually. And it's come from a collaboration with an artist called Andy Fleur, who I was paired with as part of a correspondence project with Letchworth Broadway Gallery and Exeter Phoenix Gallery. And we were given a paired artist, which they very carefully selected, actually, with things that would resonate. And he's very much interested in visualising foley sound and elements of place and things that are left or removed, etc. So, I <coughs> totally see why they put us together. And I was commissioned to make two very small pieces of sculpture that would fit in an A4 jiffy bag. Well, hello, that was quite a challenge for me. <laughs> because I didn't want to, I could have made a photograph and I could have sent that, but I was like, no, I really want them to have a three dimensional Jesuit thing being cast using the same methodology but somehow it's going to travel in a jiffy bag. I thought, well, I can put a phone or a box around it, so that's right. But nonetheless, so I was really interested in, I was working on this work, and I thought, well, how can I make something which kind of, the cast that comes out of the mould also project, protects the fragility of the things that kind of emerge from it. So I thought, well, a kind of curved form, but the inside of it rather than the outside of the brutalist telephone exchange, so to speak. Um, and so all the, again, the same methodology, so all the markings, the biro, the paint, anything that's on the surface, including the marks where I've had to get it out of the mould, are all there through the process. They don't get added on at all afterwards. So they all come through the thing making itself to an extent. And so all the, the biro lines, which we used to grid up a piece of foam board for the mould and then score so I could create this form, are embedded in the surface of the jessamite glass. And it's actually, I'm not necessarily inviting everyone to touch it, but it is very, they're all ridges, there are very fine ridges across the surface that are where the thing has been scored. And the whole thing in this case isn't a locking together, but it's, it locks itself together in the process because it's one pouring. So the whole thing has happened in the one mould. So this is some large work I made on the back of the correspondence because I got really excited about that. When I, when I come into a space, although I have, because obviously the piece of sculpture, I have to know that they're going to stack up, I can't just guess at that totally. But when I come into a space, I will always look at the space and see where or not the things will, will fit, even though I've been here before, it's suggested to me pins and things go higher, because I love the way it kind of entered the 
ceiling beams and the surfaces top. So that's when I walked in here and saw the two kind of orangey tower blocks over there through the window, I was like, yes, I love that connection with the world outside. So that's another thing that I would do in terms of going into a space and installing, albeit I know roughly in this case what work is going in. And the rocks are, you know, things that I've gathered, so they're all mine from my collection of recent and less recent travels. And they provide form, a palette as well, for groups of work that I make. They're not named until the end. I thought, hang on a sec, but because of your method, and because of the way you approach it, there isn't an end. In fact, they can imagine all these pieces looking together in different ways to, you know, in, con yes. in a constant process of becoming together. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, so, so that they, they, you know, that I find fascinating, and maybe they... They come to a point, I suppose, is a, a more accurate way, so where they, they realise them, themselves and they, yeah, they some point where stand up and go, I am kind of a something, you know, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> I was very surprised, it's surprising to see this piece. And it immediately, when we've been talking about Bennett on the odd occasion, yes. and Haraway, I was thinking it's, it, it really has this kind of almost sort of phantasmagoric figurative sense about it mm. and it's kind of posthumanist it feels really quite you know posthumanist to me yeah it's it's kind of interesting that the work is going in that well go, it goes in various directions but it feels I mean it does feel like this these things can take flight yes yeah. maybe it's a reflection to a, a space where you're also taking flight. Possibly, yeah. I think there have been kind of like small elements of that possibly previous in some of the work where they might have appeared a bit like sort of jellyfish swimming or but not yes. quite or spaceships at the same time. So I know, you know, Rob once talked about cluster, the, the piece cluster in that sense. So it's almost like a sort of hybrid kind of space vehicle stroke, you know, jellyfish world thing, you know. This balance between the kind of serendipity of the markings, I mean, actually, everything that is picked up off the floor is laid on the floor. At some point. At yeah. some point. Yes. I mean, there is a layering of, of, of the narrative of all the pieces mm. that you make, and you don't disturb that when you begin the next piece. But is, is this, well, you add to it, actually, but there is this intention. You don't know what's going to happen, but Not exactly, you make no. yeah. some intentional decisions about yeah. what you're going to lay down next. And Yeah, and that's where, you know, the palette comes in, or the rock form, or the, yeah. the inspiration that point so it has some kind of trigger as to what's laid down but I don't obsessively clean the before you know for example but in the natural process of scraping lumps off obviously the before goes to some extent but not entirely yeah like repainting a wall you know you will scrape down thus far but something will always be there underneath When you were constructing this one, where do you start with like the stuff that looks kinetic, looks like it might move, or sort of mechanical? Did you have that in mind when you, because each one is cast, isn't it? Each mm -hmm. stick. Yeah. Had you in mind that you were going to put them together? Yes, but I wasn't quite sure how. I was, in fact, I, I didn't. So the, the first piece that was cast was the, the, the middle section. Mm -hmm. And actually these 
these pieces were going to do something else. They were from another. So they weren't even, I mean, it was making it at the same time, but yeah. not necessarily that it would come into one piece of work. So that's another thing that often happens. Um, and I was thinking more like, kind of, I was thinking about bridges a lot, yeah? and I sort of pile on and things like that. And so I, I start to kind of name what I think it might be that I'm doing, but then of course when it comes to it, and it sort of is butted up against one of the other forms, then, or laid down next to it, then that's what I start to think, well actually, maybe this develop into some completely different form. Is that to and fro movement between mm. referencing the real world and the internal world, which constantly, and there's an ambiguity that's very seductive in the middle of those two things which you trust. Yeah. <laughs> actually. Terrifying, and you just chuck the things away and go, oh, that's not, I, can't, I can't put that together. Or, you know, this gets more luscious the more I look at it, actually. It's, uh, I actually find the, um, the mechanical parts of it, the texture is gorgeous. But I kind of, you know, something that we don't think about, the mechanical parts have a gorgeous texture. I think it always reminds me of um, Charlie Chaplin film, Modern Times. And the machinery is, is just aesthetically fabulous. Mm -hmm. It has a similar sort of feel to it. I remember going to the um, Science Museum once and seeing the undercarriage of a Boeing 747. Oh, wow. And when you get up close, I mean, it was, it was high on this studio, yeah. right? It was fantastically complex. Yeah. It's yeah. a great work of sculpture, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, and they all... So, coming back to Ali and the, your sort of um, question about the stick, so they were all cast, they just cast um, bits of jesmonite. And I don't have any, I don't measure them. So I didn't measure them. They're not made in that kind of way. I didn't go, well, I'm gonna... So it was more like I'm just casting different lengths. So it's more like you're going into a wood and picking up a range of different length sticks and then you are building something with what you have. So that that's where the, the design comes from, the, the found scenes, really. So it kind of echoes that. Which is quite exciting because obviously, it was, I mean, it's a bit scary because it's, you know, you're just like, oh my god, this isn't, can't go that way, I have to go this way, and it won't, you know. So, thinking about that engineering thing, um, whenever I go past the Albert Bridge, I'm always thinking about the fact that within that bridge, which is unusual, there are three forms of bridge making built into the bridge, three forms of which uh, is extraordinary, <laughs> just as, a, as an idea, because it's so much, there's so much risk in it. And when you're talking about being terrified, I know exactly what you're talking about when you're in the middle of making work and you don't know where you're going. I mean, if you did know, well, not, that's not necessarily true. Some people do know where they're going and they're very happy and satisfied with knowing where they're going, but you don't know where you're going. No. And that, that fear, having to, tolerate that dis-ease within the making of work. 
And sometimes it's a very short-lived disease, you know, and other times it's very long, like months, and you're kind of like, okay, don't throw it out the door, literally. Just leave it there. And then, then you know as well, that's going. series of other things which then informs you about the thing you had no, absolutely no idea what it was, where it was going, was there any point worth coming. And so it, you know, artists talk about making work simultaneously, but I think it's about, you know, going to something else and it's not simultaneous really because you, you're actually going to something else and leaving it, you know, and then you turn and turning around, and it's uh, and then do that, and go to something else, and that thing's still sitting there. I mean, I've got stuff in the studio that's sitting there, and, you know, which was started for this show. Made long processes of making not all, you know, and it's still sitting there. I'm like, I don't know what what it is. It was. I have no idea. What might be nothing. But, you know, keep it for the time being in case, you know, suddenly lends itself or decides itself to something else. But there's a certain amount of planning because you have to build hearts and make them connect. You intend, you know, you say that there's this kind of intricate puzzle in the So there must be a pre-empting of something that maybe well, going... yeah, although <clears throat> to some extent, but then these, oh. this piece was originally built something else, not for this. So the tail is part of, you know, it's from one of the moulds, so it wasn't, and it was more, so in the case of this piece of work, it was more about, okay, this, this needs something to sort of slot into, like as if it grown into the thing, or the shuttering is growing around it, but then it's a case of, it's sort of structural elements, so does it stand up? So what does it actually need when it lands to stand up? Because if you like, it's not in flight, whatever. So it all, so oh, that's something which is a bit tail-like over there, or, you know. So it sometimes appears as well that it's more prescribed. Obviously then more has to be built onto here, which then, so how can it, without it fitting, actually being sort of fixed together? Still loose, it's three pieces that are that slot. Yeah, so it's sometimes things that look like they've been designed from the start haven't either, and other things which don't look like that kind of not have not have been designed from the start, but yeah, it's a weird thing. It's only if I'm breaking it down when you're saying that to me that I can even remember that that's what happened, you know, to be honest. Relationship as well as architecture, doesn't it? Actively move towards using spaces built of environments. Well, it's part of conversation. I'm not even sure what it's referencing, it seems to be a conversation. For me, when I think about um, the swimming pool. Mm. Telephone exchange, and it's this interrelationship between the, the natural world as well as this built environment. But um, you know, having having grown up in a household of an architect, it's quite interesting that those things now 